This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. More than ever, there seems to be an increase in suicides in our nation, from Hollywood superstars to an epidemic among teens who each week take their own life. And all friends and family can say is, we never saw it coming. Today, we're gonna to talk with Daniel Fusco. He's a pastor and author in Vancouver, Washington, who'll share how his church approaches these tragedies. Also, we'll talk to a hospital administrator who's seeing firsthand how the opioid epidemic could be a harder problem to solve than many people think. But first, why are so many Christian teens losing interest in the church? It's a question I'm asking author and speaker Sean McDowell. You may know him from his father, Josh McDowell, who he's co-authored many books with, including Evidence That Demands a Verdict. One of the things I saw in here was that the Gen Zs are leaving the church at an unprecedented rate. I mean, they're not even staying in church through high school in, in a lot of cases. I'm glad you said the church, because sometimes people said that young people and Gen Z are leaving the faith in droves. I'm not sure that's entirely true. There certainly are some that are, but a lot of them are disengaged in the church. And this has happened in the past, Bob, as you know, previous generations, Gen X and millennials, there was concern about them disengaging the church. And many would come back when they had kids mm -hmm. and they got to those life-defining moments later on. But what's happened to this generation is many of them are not getting married. Those who are getting married, many are not having kids. And they're doing that even later. So we're wondering, are many who are disengaged in the church, are they going to come back the way previous generations have? In some, way that, in some ways, that's still an open question. Would they be drawn back by relationships that they had in the church or relationships that they had with other Christians? Uh, you, you mentioned in the book that even though they're well connected through the Internet and social media, and, and this generation is probably more connected than anybody's been, they're also the loneliest gener generation we've seen up until now because they're on their phones, they're on their iPads, but they're not in a relationship face to face with people. That's a really interesting way that you put it, because there's kind of a paradox with this generation that they're more connected than any generation, but they're also lonelier, that they have more information, but arguably less wisdom. So we have to be able to balance that with this generation. And many of them will come back because we build relationships with them. I think kids really want to be known and loved and have a caring adult step into their life and say, you matter to me. You know, in a, in a church setting or a youth group setting, you develop relationships with, with teenagers and you talk to them, you have these discussions. And a lot of times they take carte blanche what people were saying. This generation, as soon as, you, and even while you're talking to them, are checking it out on, they're, they're, they're referencing it on, on Google or someplace. And they're gonna check what you say almost immediately. I think that gives challenge to the reference that we hear. We live in a post-truth culture. Two or three years ago, the word of the day or the word of the year was post-truth. And it's certainly the case that for a lot of people, feelings determine truth and feelings trump truth. But on the flip side, when I'm talking to this generation, they're researching it. They're looking it up. They want to know. They have questions and they feel like they can find an answer. So if I say something that they're not quite sure... They're Googling it in front of me and checking it. So that means people like you and people like me who have a chance to speak that this generation might listen to, we have to get our facts right or we will lose credibility in front of them. So I say you better have a good understanding of your own Christian worldview and some idea of apologetics when you go into that relationship with that, with that student. You better be prepared. Well, that's, of course, what's in Scripture. First Peter 3.15 is to be always ready. be ready with an answer. But I also want to say to adults, they don't have to know everything. You don't have to be the expert. You just have to be willing to step into the life of a young person, build a relationship, ask them good questions, be a good listener. And if you're available and they ask a question you don't know, just say, gosh, let's look it up together and let's find an answer. So the more we know and study, the better prepared we are. But I don't want adults thinking I've got to have it all figured out before I can reach this generation. When I'm going to reach... Uh, program my cell phone, I take it to my seven or eight year old granddaughter because she <laughs> understands it. And I think a lot of adults, a lot of parents, even maybe younger youth pastors are intimidated by some of the tools that Gen Z take for granted. Are you more concerned about the tools and the social media? Or are you more concerned about the message that they're getting from those places? I actually love that you asked the question that way. Rarely does some, I don't think anybody's asked me that way because I'm actually concerned about both. And it's hard to say which one is more damaging the other. It's obvious that the messages coming through of greed and consumerism mm -hmm. and selfishness and sexuality, 
those messages concern me, but it also concerns me how somebody's brain is being rewired and they're constantly in need of being stimulated by looking at their phone nonstop and don't have any time to just sit and talk. Or like it says in the Bible, be still and know that I am the Lord. The medium of technology, although I love technology, if we don't have boundaries and we're not thoughtful about it, it can deeply shape us as much as the message. Yeah, and, and a lot of this book deals with, with how to transmit the message. Uh, do you deal much in here with, with how parents should use uh, the technology? We do. We have a chapter uh, towards the end called Love Equips, mm -hmm. and it talks about giving boundaries to kids when it comes to smartphones. It also talks about using things like songs and movies and smartphones and other kinds of social media like YouTube as practical ways to engage this conversation with young people. So we kind of talk about both. Okay, and one of the, the just the pivotal things you have here is developing a Christian worldview. That the, these kids are there's so many competing worldviews that they're faced with. Describe the importance of that Christian worldview. What what flows out of that? Well, worldview is basically a view of the world. It's a way of understanding reality. And of course, we live out of what we think is true and real mm -hmm. and good. Well, everybody has a worldview, but many in this generation, many even older generations don't know where they got their worldview. They don't know if it's true, and they're not even really aware of how much their belief system shapes the way they live. Now, Barna's research shows that if people who see the world like Jesus are more likely to live like Jesus. So if we want to shape this generation, we have to build relationships with them. We have to help them see the world Christianly and then give them practical ways to live it out. I mean, Scripture talks a ton about how we are in really a battle of ideas. Yeah. And what we believe about the world has eternal implications. And in that battle of ideas, these, these kids are inundated with several different worldviews. What's, what's probably the, the, the current worldview that's easiest for them to accept that might surprise their parents? Oh, gosh, easiest to accept. I think some of the biggest worldviews that shape this generation would be, I think naturalism shapes it very strong. I think there's a strong consumerist bent. But perhaps the strongest one is just this push towards uh, self-authenticity. Be true to yourself. If I believe it, it's true for me. If I feel it, it's real for me. And we have no right to judge anybody else. That's kind of this modus operandi that's pushed into this generation. So they resist external authority and ideas, yet inside they're thinking, as long as I feel it, it's true for me. That's harder for many in the older generation to accept and understand. Should a parent panic if, they, if, they, if, they're, if their teen exposes you know, this, this worldview? Should they panic or should they just look at that as, a, as an opportunity uh, to really open up to that teenager or to, to discuss it? Some of the feedback that I've really enjoyed in the book is that people have said, this isn't like a freak out book that says the sky is falling, everything is bad. It was actually kind of hopeful. And there's plenty of things to be concerned about in the world today, and especially when it's our own kids. But one of the things I really learned from my dad is he would think through ahead of time all the possible scenarios that us kids, myself and my three sisters, would find ourselves in. Like, what if my daughter came to my dad and said, hey, dad, I'm pregnant. What if I came to my dad and said, dad, I'm just dropping out of school. I'm going to work over here or whatever scenario it was. And he had thought through in his mind how to respond so he wouldn't panic. And that's the kind of advice we're giving to parents. Let's think this through ahead of time. So when we're in that moment and inside we might be panicking, we can show love and acceptance of the person, even if we disagree with the decision and keep that relationship going for the sake of a longer impact. The longer impact. Something interesting, I want you to uh, kind of close this segment on this. Uh, and parents might think about this too, if a kid comes to them and says that I I'm an atheist, and they, they panic over that, what, what's worse in your mind if the, if, the, if the child comes and says, I'm an atheist, or I'm a Hindu, I'm this, I'm that, or I, I just really don't care about God. I'm, I'm just apathetic about it. I don't, I, don't even, I don't care whether you talk about it or not, because I'm not gonna, I'm yeah, apathetic. You know, it's hard for me to say which one is worse than the other. I would definitely say in this generation as a whole, there's a lot more kids who say they're apathetic and they don't care. You know, sometimes when somebody comes to me and says, I'm an atheist, I hate God, I'm like, okay, you have strong opinions. Let's talk about this. And I'm not saying every atheist says that, mm -hmm. 
But typically someone who defines himself as an atheist has thought this through and has opinions and at least cares about the issue and understands it. When someone says, I don't care, man, it's hard to light a fire there. Yeah, it is. It really is. Well, the book is, So the Next Generation Will Know, Preparing Young Christians for a Challenging World. Sean McDowell, thank you for being with us today. Where can they get the book? Because there's a lot of parents out there and youth pastors that are saying, I, I need that. Yeah, your local bookstore or Amazon.com carries them. They will ship them to you probably on a drone this afternoon if you want it that quickly. <laughs> and your blog address. Where, where, can we hear, where, where can we hear more about what's going on there? I also have a blog and a ton of videos and resources at SeanMcDowell.org. The battle for the hearts and minds of our next generation continues. This year, researchers have found suicides in the U.S. are up 33% since 1999. In fact, is at its highest since World War II. While many are trying to find answers to why we're losing so many to suicide every month, I wanted to find out more about how churches are dealing with the aftermath of a suicide. So I'm turning to a frequent guest on Viewpoint, Pastor Daniel Fusco of Crossroads Community Church in Vancouver, Washington. Hey, one, one statistic I want to talk to you about, uh, and I'm, I'm sure it's probably just as prevalent on the West Coast as, as the East Coast and these flyover states, but it, the second leading cause of death of 10 year olds to 24 year olds now is suicide. Uh, it, it just seems like it's, it's, it's growing all the time. It's, it's doubled since 19, I think 2008 to 2015, it doubled. And uh, it's almost epidemic proportions here. And what's it doing out there? You know, same thing. It's that uh, uh, childhood, young people committing suicide is at an epidemic proportion uh, where I live in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, it, it, unfortunately, there's not a, you know, a season that goes by that we are not uh, grieving uh, the loss of a, a younger person to uh, self-inflicted uh, you know, uh, suicide, de you know, death by suicide. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a horrible situation that we're seeing in our young people. I read that, that this is the gen, gen Z, Generation Z, the most connected generation ever. I mean, they've, you go on Facebook and these kids have hundreds of friends. They're, they're well connected on with their, all their social media. Yeah, I'm not sure they're walking home from school with anybody, but they've got a lot of friends on the Internet. And yet they've, they're, they're saying that they're the loneliest generation ever, even though they've got all of these online friends. Do you think that's part of it? Well, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of factors to it, but I do believe, you know, I, I like social media like the next person, but there's, there's, there is a way that you can be uh, super connected but feel completely alone because ultimately for all of us, you know, non, nobody feels truly uh, united just to other people. God didn't create us just to have interpersonal relationships. He created us first to have a spiritual relationship with Him. You know, Jesus said, and lo, I'm with you always, even into the end of the age. And, you know, we read in the Old Testament where God says, you know, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so there's nothing worse than having tons of friends, tons of followers, tons of people who like your pictures, but still feeling completely alone in the world. But that is part, unfortunately, of the human condition uh, as it exists today. And, and where that happens, it, you know, unfortunately, hopelessness, be, you know, comes quickly on the heels of these things. You, you think young, young people are, are desperate for that connection that they'd, they'd only receive in Jesus Christ? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the Bible teaches in the book of Ecclesiastes that God has placed eternity in all of our hearts. And so I remember as a young person, you know, not in this generation, you know, I'm, I'm in my uh, early 40s now, but I remember as a young person being popular, having tons of friends. This was before social media. I remember, you know, I remember this was before we had cell phones in our pockets. I, I, I remember times of have, being surrounded by all my friends and feeling completely alone. And only later did I realize I didn't grow up in a, in a, in a Christian Christian home, only later did I realize that I was longing for, to, to know who I truly was, to have my purpose defined for me, not by my peer group or by my parents, but, but by the Lord, by the God who created and sustained me. So I know for me, I came to know Jesus at 21. That was absolutely pivotal uh, for me because it absolutely changes the way I saw everything. So yes, I think every gender, and even right now, you know, let alone the young people, I think even in the older generations, I mean, the boomers uh, need Jesus as much as any other generation right now. And so I think without it, we're, we're left trying to figure out how to build an identity uh, without the essential component of who we truly are, which is Jesus himself. Well, one thing we're seeing is that uh, if, if a, a student in a school commits suicide, then 
all of a sudden the administration and the parents are panicking, is there going to be another one and another one and another one, even in that same school? And they're saying things like, I, I did not see this coming. I didn't see the signs. What should I have been looking for? Yeah, and, and that's really unfortunate because I think in a social media world, I mean, nobody ever puts their worst pictures on social media. Nobody ever goes on to LinkedIn if you're older and, and puts like, well, I got fired from this job because I was a lousy employee. It's like you make it sound a certain way. And so we're, we're, we live in a day and age where, where life is airbrushed, where, where everything is looking perfect. And almost none of us, like nobody sends out their, their, their Christmas card with their family on it where everyone just has a, a horrible face on it, right? And so uh, people have learned the art of being able to put on a mask, but deep inside, um, not being not being real or not feeling comfortable or feeling so much shame that they don't share it. And that's why I think the church, you know, it's so important for the for the people of God to be salt and light in within their communities. Like, the, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to wait till someone's in such a bad spot that they reach out to the church. When we, I think the church, God designed us to be proactively in our schools, in our community, our youth pastors and our youth leaders should be in the community, building those relationships and trying to create safe environments that draws people out so that they can be able to share, look, I'm really struggling in this area. I'm really, I'm really hurting in this area. And I think not only the church being the front lines, but also the church being the front lines, also inviting medical professionals and families into these discussions. Because I think for a lot of kids, they don't feel they, they can talk to anyone. Their parents are focused on certain things. Maybe uh, their teachers are focused on other things. They, they, they feel overwhelmed. They feel like they, they're never going to do it well enough. And so I think, you know, we want uh, the church, we want uh, families, and we want medical professionals to get involved because you realize that the desire to end your own life goes against every impulse that we are created with as human beings. Do you think the parents are intimidated by that, though, that, they, that they're almost afraid to look behind the screen? Um, so that, that's a great question. And, and I think for oftentimes, like we, we, we want to believe that our kids are doing well. I think inherently, like as a parent of three kids, you know, part of what you're doing, you look at yourself and you say, you know, I hope I'm doing a good job. And, and, and when they're struggling, we have a tendency to maybe look over that and say, oh, maybe it's not that bad, you know? And so I, I know for me as a parent, one of my goals uh, is to be able to have a great relationship with my kids can tell me anything. They can tell me the good stuff and the bad stuff. And, and, and my bride, Lynn, and I have worked really hard to cultivate that. Now as our, our oldest is in his early teenage years, we're seeing that we're grateful that we, we laid that foundation, but now we're hoping that that foundation is going to hold for us for the, you know, the next 10, 15 years as, as he moves his way you know, through adolescence and the teenage years into adulthood. And so I think we, we, we want to be able to open up those conversations. I think even being able to you know, talk to kids and saying, listen, you know, I was re I was watching this TV program and, and they were talking about the, the epidemic of suicide. And, you know, do you ever have those thoughts? And, and do, do your friends struggle with that? And is there anything that I need to know? And I think opening up, you know, making a safe space that we, we allow young people to be able to share their feelings, you know, to be able to have, to be heard, to be able to be loved, to be able to say, yeah, I remember my teenagers. That was hard years. You know, things were changing. I didn't know what was going on. All of those things are, 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 are better than not talking about it and then only realizing later that, you know, somebody was crying out for help but didn't even know how to say anything about it. How do you as a, as a pastor and how does a church respond to, to someone who's lost someone that way? Well, yeah. So, I mean, as a church, when that happens, and unfortunately we have had this happen, is, you know, we, we run a great ministry here at Crossroads called uh, Grief Share. Uh, and that's for people who've had losses in all different parts of their life. It's, it's kind of a nationally known ministry that we run here at Crossroads. You know, we also realize that when uh, somebody loses uh, especially specifically a parent, uh, a child to suicide, that, that it's going to take a lot more care than, uh, than just a nor than another situation. I mean, you know, as somebody, I lost my mother, uh, some years ago and that was very hard, but, but as a child, you expect that, you know, at some point you lose your parents, but for parents, you know, uh, parents are not equipped to bury children. I always say that, that they're, you know, God knows what it's like to bury a child as, uh, Jesus went to the cross and rose again, but you know, it, it's, it's a messy journey. And I think the people of God, the, the local church should be a part of that, walking people through that. And we, you know, as a church, unfortunately, we've had to walk people through it. We've seen the messes in the midst of that, the challenges. You know, we tell people it's okay not to be okay uh, in the midst of it. Uh, gre the grieving is a process and it's not a straight line process. And so I think a lot of times 
uh, as a local church, we have to be careful not to want to just make things really easy, you know, and we want to make it as efficient as possible because sometimes walking someone through the stages of grief for the loss of a, of, a, of a child just takes time and it takes work. And so we just have to, we signed up for this as the people of God because Jesus doesn't give up on us on our messy days, doesn't say, well, listen, you've been grieving this too long, so you just have to get over it now. He's like, he just bears with us because, uh, you know, as we know, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is long suffering. The definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, love suffers long, or some trailers, love is patient. And so I think God invites us into that if that happens in our church family or in our local community. The opioid crisis, it's unlike anything we've ever seen. It's an addiction that's impacting every age and every lifestyle. And in most cases, it involves people with no prior drug addiction. Dr. Herman Williams is a hospital administrator and a believer. I want to know more about his viewpoint on this crisis and what can be done about the epidemic. It seems like every night on the news we hear about the opioid epidemic and, and what it's doing to Americans, millions of Americans addicted to painkillers. And with me right now is Dr. Herman Williams. Been in uh, the medical field for years, both as a doctor and a resident, but now as a, as a consultant and also in, involved in hospital administration. Where are we right now in this, what we know is an, is an epidemic in America? So right now, I believe we're trying to figure out how we got to this point. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are um, many people that would like to blame the pharmaceutical industry on everything. Yeah. Of course, I think that is just one of the um, elements that have put us here. I think the other big reason why we're where we are is that we've set this expectation that nobody is supposed to experience any pain. Uh, you're supposed to be pain-free after you have your triple bypass. <laughs> uh, and so we give you these medications. And I think where the pharmaceutical industry does bear some responsibility is that someone knew these were going to be addictive. Um, there's some data, and I'm just giving you rough estimates here, Bob, but there's some data that people who are on uh, three refills of a narcotic they found that 50% of those individuals will still be taking narcotics a year later. That is absolutely devastating uh, data. So once they're on it for that third refill, then they're in serious trouble. Is this just, they are a, on is this just a, a, an American phenomenon because we want to get away from pain? Or is this, is this a Western civilization or is it worldwide now? I, I think there is some evidence, and again, I'm not going to pretend like I'm an expert, but I've read some evidence where it does seem like a lot of this is an American phenomenon. There are other cultures that say, look, you're going to be in pain, mm -hmm. and don't jump to narcotics, jump to meditation, uh, augmented with um, uh, some anti-inflammatories and other non-addictive uh, medications post-procedure, as an example. Mm -hmm. We have completely gone to narcotics as a solution to the elimination of pain. Yeah, and you, you went through your own situation, your own physical situation as a, yes. as a young resident uh, when you were 31 years old, experiencing all kinds of issues. Uh, how do you relate to these people that are coming out of uh, surgery, like you said, a bypass surgery or something like that? How do you relate to them and, and say, you are gonna experience some pain, we don't wanna get you addicted? Yeah. So I actually had quite a bit of pain. Uh, the procedure that I had, which at that time, you know, now when you get uh, an implantable surgical defibrillator, they'll make a very small incision up here where they put pacemakers and they'll feed a wire through one of your uh, vessels into your heart. For me, I actually had to have a thoracotomy. They actually opened up my chest between ribs nine and ten and sewed patches around the heart. And those patches were the ones that would detect the heart rate. Uh, and if it were abnormal, the device would deliver a current. But um, I had significant post-op pain, but I am one of those individuals that gets sick when I take a lot of narcotics. Mm -hmm. So I have a built-in mechanism that <laughs> prevents me from <laughs> being addicted. But there are a lot of other individuals who do not have that mechanism and they just continue, continue uh, to take them. And then well after you've gone through a period of time where you shouldn't need them, 
they get addicted to the, of course, the euphoria is that's it, associated yeah. with it. Is there a way we can reach out to those people? I mean, we, we know people in, in families that, uh, that are wonderful people and they happen to be addicted yes. to opioids. Is there a way to reach out and, and help them outside of the medical profession? Yes, first, there needs to be a recognition um, that the faces of people who are addicted are not, <laughs> you know, skid row people yeah. on the street. They're you and me. They're people who are employed. They're people who have businesses. They're people who are successful. But so first of all, we got to understand this is a problem for society. And, and the church can reach out to those individuals and provide education and support and alternative ways to handle pain. Um, so that's number one, is acknowledging that this is not a, patient, uh, a problem for undesirables uh, in our society. This is really all of us. Mm. Typically, people feel shame by this, and they don't sh let people know that they're addictive. They just, they'll do anything to get that next fix. Yeah. So it's a very serious problem. And very, very, very complicated. We don't want to simplify that, but you've been, you've been involved in medicine a long time. You're also yes, a believer in Christ. You, you think there's a place for prayer, not in just in this case, but in, in all of medicine. Have you seen a place where prayer really makes a difference in people's lives as they recover? I believe so. I think your state of mind uh, and your expectations around the results of a particular illness can rapidly help you heal faster. Mm -hmm. I prayed and prayed and prayed when I was getting shocked by my defibrillator. I just prayed. I said, God, give me the strength. I know that this is going to get better. And um, if you've got um, a serious illness, praying and saying, give me the strength to deal with this so that I can get on the other side of it. I absolutely think that that has an impact on the outcome. Yeah. I think for those people who have, they have no hope, completely hopeless, got no one to turn to, those are the individuals that succumb to illness much quicker. Mm -hmm. And even people who, let's say, actually die and are not expected to die because they were completely hopeless. So I do think faith plays a major role in the healing process. Not only praying for yourself, but being surrounded by people who do pray and believe in the power of that. Absolutely. Dr. Williams, thank you so much. He is the author of Clear, Dream, uh, Living the Life You Never Dreamed Of. And again, where's that book available? The book is available on Amazon.com. It's available on my website, clearlivingthedream.com. Viewpoint with Bob Lacey is now available as a podcast. Download your favorite podcast app like iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify, and search for Viewpoint with Bob Lacey. Subscribe and listen as we discuss these important topics each week. You can find out more about today's guest on our website. And I want to let you know there are two great ways to help spread the word about the show. One, we'd appreciate your financial support as Viewpoint has no advertising. It's supported by you. The second... Log on to YouTube and find our Viewpoint interviews and like, subscribe, and share with your friends. The more people who like our YouTube videos, the better chance our gospel message can rise to the top of search engines and help others learn about the truth of the Bible. Thanks for joining us today. You can listen to the Viewpoint podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast.